So uh, the next subject that we are going to discuss, this is the diagnosis of the pituitary disorders. We do have a lecture about the pituitary, pathophysiology of the pituitary, but in this lecture, mainly we are going to summarize the diagnostic process that can evaluate the pituitary disorders. Now, very importantly, it's important to revise your study of physiology and basically the regulation of the anterior pituitary. These are the feedback mechanism, the negative and positive feedback mechanism that is regulating, let's see, the hormone, the target hormone, uh, the target organ released hormone concentration. Mostly the target hormone is the negative feedback that is altering the pituitary that reduces the trop hormones, the trop hormones that regulate the tr uh, target hormone uh, action. Plus, additionally, they do have a long loop feedback that affecting the hypothalamus. So as you see here, at least we do have the hypothalamus pituitary. And if you go above, there's the hypothalamus and the central nervous system. The central nervous system signing or giving the impulse to the hypothalamus, the hypothalamus is going to release some releasing hormones or releasing factors that regulate the pituitary positively. However, in some case such as the prolactin, for example, we do have a negative effect from the hypothalamus. So usually the prolactin synthesis or prolactin release of the pituitary is negatively regulated by dopamine. Now, immediately from the trope hormone, they do have a short loop feedback action that can alter the releasing hormone uh, level in the blood. So these three is very important to see how we are going to a distributor, how we are going to discuss the different uh, diseases that as we controlled as a primary disease in endocrine function, usually that includes the target organ. Secondary is then the pituitary is affected. And based on the different hormone levels, the releasing or the drop hormone levels, we can evaluate which level we are. The tertiary, that's when we do have the hypothalamic disorders. Now, this table contains a summary of the diseases or the hormones, what we have here. For example, these are the hypothalamic regulatory hormones, okay? This is what the releasing hormone that is going to alter the pituitary hormone levels and further the target gland. And here is listed the last column listed, which hormone feedbacking, let's see this action. Now, such as, for example, the GNRH or the gonadotropin releasing hormone that regulates the LH FSH that is released from the pituitary. And these hormones affecting all the gonads in male, the testosterone, and in female, the estrogen and inhibin that is going to alter the pituitary and the hypothalamus. The CRH or the corticotropin releasing hormone that regulates the pituitary ACTH release that affecting the adrenal gland, mainly the glucocorticoids. This is why the cortisol is that negative feedback hormone. The GHRH or growth hormone releasing hormone that causes the release of the growth hormone and for sure affecting on the liver and some other organs, but usually the IGF-1 is the hormone, the effective hormone that causes a feedback for the GH releasing hormone. Somatostatin that negatively usually affecting the growth hormone releases. A TRH, the thyroid releasing hormone, that can affect of the TSH and a highly elevated TRH can increase the prolactin hormone level as well. But normally in a physiologic range, the prolactin is not altered by uh, TRH. 
that of course the TSH affecting the thyroid gland and causes an in increase of the T4, the thyroxine or T3 level. But mainly the T4 is feedbacking the pituitary. Now, prolactin releasing hormone that affecting on the prolactin and prolactin causes the breast development and the gland uh, formation in the bed. So usually causes galactoria when in female and male, we do have the milk production increase. The dopamine, that's a prolactin release inhibiting hormone that negatively alters the prolactin level. I mentioned before that measuring the trope hormone levels and the target hormone levels, we can specify whether we do have a primary or secondary problem. Let's see this graph. If we do have a low target hormone level, so we are going to talk about the hypofunction. If we do have a low target hormone level, so it meaning that is no feedback for the pituitary. If the pituitary, uh, let's see, works perfectly, what it does, the trope hormone level will increase. So in primary hypofunction, when the target gland cannot synthesize hormone, the trope hormone level always increased. However, if the pituitary doesn't work perfectly, both trope hormone level and target hormone level be lower. Now, in another case, it's hyperfunction. If we do have a primary hyperfunction, what will happen? We do have too much hormone synthesized by the target gland, for example, in primary hyperthyroidism. This T4 feedbacking the pituitary, so the trope hormone level be low. So in primary hyperfunction, the elevated target hormone level associated with the low trope hormone level. However, if the problem originated in the pituitary, the secondary level, both the trope hormone level and the target hormone level be high. So these are essential things that you should memorize to evaluate and to see whether that's a secondary, primary, hyper or hyper function we do have. The most common thing usually the target gland diseases. So the primary disease is the most common one and the secondary is relatively less common. Now let's see how can we evaluate the endocrine function. Basically, there are some testes hormone testes, such as measuring the static hormone levels. But, but the problem with measuring that is the hormone levels, because they usually, they do have dionar written. So this is why one sample is not enough. In case of growth hormone production, if you measure the growth hormone, the static level doesn't mean too much because growth hormone level is, can be altered by the glucose serum, glucose concentration, by the daily rhythm, by the stress situation. But if you're measuring, for example, the IGF-1, that is more stable, so that can be used for the static hormone evaluation. In other case, when we do have the diurnal rhythm, we can use some dynamic testes. So you are measuring in the morning, in the afternoon, in the night, that can reflect how the daily changes occurs in this uh, hormone level. Another thing, we can use stimulation and suppression test. Stimulation test usually is used when we do have a hypofunction and suppression test usually used when we do have a hyperfunction in clinical sign. Now, another thing, Neuropath of, uh, path, uh, neuro ophthalmology, for example, visual test is used to evaluate the pituitary. If you do have any kind of enlargement of the pituitary gland, because the chiasma is right lining of the top of the pituitary, that can cause a visual field disturbance, usually by temporal hemianopsia can happen. Neuroradiology, MRI, usually is choose to detect any kind of problem in the brain. CT usually in the peripheral organs, but you can use some PET SPECT evaluation using some uh, labeled amino acid to detect the function of the gland. 
Now let's start with the pituitary diseases and with one or more of the following uh, problem may present it, such as, for example, deficiency of one or more pituitary hormones that usually affecting that some problem, necrosis, or a non-hormone secreting tumor that can rise from the pituitary hormone. The mass effect or an expansion lesion, for example, headache, bitemporal anormia. I mentioned before because in the middle that is compressed, that usually the crossing fibers are affected, or cranial nerve palsy, hydrocephalus, and epilepsy can happen if you do have any kind of enlargement in the brain. And other thing, sometimes is accidentally do detecting some kind of mass by MRI uh, that taken for a different reason. If you do have this, it's called the incidentaloma because there is no specific clinical sign, but you do see the mass. If it's less than one centimeter, let's see 10 millimeters, that's called microadenoma. If it's bigger than 10, 10 millimeters, so one centimeter, that's called macroadenoma. Now let's talk about first the hypo function of the pituitary, that is called the hypopituitarism. We do have a lecture about this pathophysiology, so that's be uh, much easier to follow that. What can cause hypopituitarism? That can be some developmental abnormalities or perinatal asphyxia, hypoxia, for example or pituitary lesions, some could be vascular problem, aneurysm, infarction, hemorrhage. That was a very typical one, the Sheehan syndrome, the postpartum pituitary necrosis, or trauma, surgery, irradiation, or hormonally inactive large adenomas, for example, non-hormone secreting tumor, or intracellular metastasis, or infection or empty cell turcica rarely cause the clinically manifestation or hormone deficiency when it's compressed out from the pituitary, or hypothalamic injuries such as carangiopharyngiomas, or hypothalamic tumor, some other things that can cause a, a pituitary uh, hypothalamic problems, or the pituitary hand the injury when we do have a problem with the pituitary stock. Now, very importantly, if you do have a central hypopituitarism, and that's a progressive situation that's depending on the sensitivity of the cells, plus the lifespan of the target hormones, we do have a typical progression or a hormone loss. In adult one, the most striking clinical symptoms can be achieved due to the FSH LH absence. So the menstrual cycle or the productivity is altered. However, in children, the growth hormone is a typical or sensitive one. Before, let's see, the, uh, the puberty develops, the growth, the linear growth uh, development or problem can be the first sign. Later on, the thyroid gland and later, let's see, the uh, adenome, the adrenal gland and prolactin and ADH. So these are the sequence how the hormone levels are decreased. When you do have the all hormone level absence, this is called the panhypopituitarism. Now growth hormone deficiency, uh, in this case, uh, what we do have, uh, Presumably absent when the TSH, ACTH, and gonadotropin hormone are missing at the same time, usually when you do have a panhypopituitarism. Now, isolated growth hormone deficiency mostly occurs in children. This is why I said that could be the very sensitive way to detect any kind of pituitary problem. Now, in childhood, growth hormone deficiency requires treatments because you can restore the normal growth, the linear growth. In adult one, the growth hormone deficiency sign or the clinical symptoms are different from a little bit. Mostly in adult one, if we don't have enough growth hormone, the body fat content increases and the waist hip ratio is altered and that increases. Now the body mass density, so the bone density of the uh, the bone density, it will decrease, and that can cause osteoporosis. 
or very frequent fracture can occur. The risk is increases by two times or the atherosclerotic, uh, let's see, uh, atherosclerosis increases. So the cholesterol of the LDH increases more than HDL. Insulin level and hypoglycemia uh, can happen to patient. Fatigue, muscle, muscle weakness, memory disorders, and what I mentioned, the children, the growth retardation can develop when we do have the GH deficiency. Now, how can we diagnose GH deficiency? Basically, a single hormone measurement is not informative because the growth hormone has a diurnal rhythm. Uh, we can use the insulin stimulation test. Insulin stimulation test meaning we are going to cause hypoglycemia and the stress, and hypoglycemia goes, it will increase the growth hormone level. So very simple. Importantly, you have to reduce the glucose concentration below three millimole per liter. Of course, you have to observe the patient and the patient should be kept in a hospital condition. Most of the supply in children. And when the little one is shivering and sweating, they are going to collect the blood and measuring the growth hormone level or another possibility, can measure the IGF-1. IGF-1 level is more stable one, so is no insulin stimulation test is needed in this case, but the insulin stimulation test is more sensitive way to diagnose a growth hormone problem. The other stimulatory test can be, for example, glucagon and arginine infusion, and usually the chloridine is not used in adult one, and but this, whatever is in gray, is not so important, but other tests in red, they are very important to detect the growth hormone deficiency. Now, gonadotropin deficiency, if we do have some problem with the gonads, for example, what can cause this gonadotropin deficiency? It will relatively the manifested testicular volume decreases, loss of facial and body hair, a suction function, and the libido decreases. In female, very sensitive way, for example, amenorrhea, usually the secondary amenorrhea. Secondary amenorrhea uh, state for those conditions when the girl already started to cycle, they already had some menstrual cycle. However, this menstrual cycle stopped, this is secondary or breast uh, atrophy, vaginal dryness. In both sex, the uh, thin skin and the bone density decreases. This can be the whole manifestation of gonadotropin deficiency. ACTH deficiency and the symptoms, weakness, tiredness, hypotension, vomiting, hypoglycemia, hyponatremia, and myalgia. So the muscle pain can be associated with the ACTH deficiency. Now, how can we diagnose, for example, ACTH deficiency? We can measure the cortisol level, but the cortisol has a diurnal rhythm. Usually it's speaking between in the morning at eight or uh, six or eight a.m. or physical, emotional stress and has uh, the release. Uh, oral uh, contraceptive therapy, estrogen increased level, for example. And if the level of the cortisol level is lower than 100 nanomoles per liter. Uh, that can be, in particularly in symptomatic patient, no need for the further test. It's meaning that the patient possibly has a deficiency. Now, another gold standard, for example, to measure the ACTH uh, deficiency, that's an insulin stimulation test. Insulin, again, that decreases the serum glucose as a stress situation, that will increase the ACTH level and that should increase the cortisol level. If it doesn't happen, that meaning that we do have an ACTH deficiency. Um, uh, this is what I mentioned that the stress, it should be the less than three or less than 2.2, let's say millimole per liter. You should avoid less glucose concentration because that can be hypoglycemia, can be lethal one. The, the hazard, this test is not so, let's see, safe because seizures that fluid balance disorders can develop. And this is why it should be the hospitalized patient. And sometimes it's contraindicated, especially when the patient has some heart diseases or a seizures. And in elderly one, when the cardiovascular status is not so good, so it's uh, contraindicated. Now, 
differential diagnosis, that's the ACT stimulation test, usually it's used to differentiate the primary and the secondary, because if you do have primary, the ACTH won't increase the cortisol level. However, in the secondary, yes, the cortisol level is going to increase, showing that the target gland is intact. DSH deficiency. In some case, a lot of case can be asymptomatic or might be presented and might add in a primary hypothyroidism. In this case, we do have a low TSH and a low free T4 levels in this patient. But very similarly for the other hormones, usually the clinical symptoms are very similar to each other. This is why it's difficult to distinguish what the cause is. Fatigue, tiredness, weakness, cold intolerance, bradycardia, depression, lethargy, constipation, menstrual abnormality, galactorea, if you do have a very highly increased TRH concentration anemia, hyponatremia, a lot of uh, as, as specific symptoms can occur. How can we diagnose? Basically by giving TRH. TRH administration, normally it will elevate the TSH concentration and further the T4 concentration. If not, you can see that if TRH doesn't work, that meaning that can co there can be a pituitary problem. Acromegaly, when we do have more hormone production, especially the growth hormone production, and usually happening in the middle age one, but if it occurs in children, that is called the giantism. We do have uh, some pictures with the uh, uh, lecture notes. That can be familiar, so that can be heredited form that happening in childhood. And Usually, it's acromegaly is slow, a larva starts, it takes decades to develop. This is why the family is not sensing any kind of shape changes of the patient. However, they do have a higher mortality and a shorter life compared to the general population. This is why it's important to differentiate. What can cause this acromegaly? Mostly, we do have an adenoma of the pituitary, about 98% the growth hormone secreting tumor. However, can be an ectopic a growth hormone releasing hormone production, the hypothalamus from the hypothalamus or the bronchus, for example, or islet cell tumor can cause it. Sometimes the growth hormone secretion, this adenoma secretes more, not only the growth hormone, but prolactin is secreted because these are two, the growth hormone and prolactin, the somatotrope hormones category that belongs to, they are very similar in their structure. The diagnosis, Normally, we do see that the positive secretion of the growth hormone, this is why the random growth hormone level uh, is needed to measure it, for example. Another one, the oral glucose tolerance test, I won't say this oral glucose tolerance test because we are not measuring the glucose. It means that oral glucose test, let's see. Uh, what it meaning that hyperglycemia is going to decrease the growth hormone level. So what they do, very similar to the oral glucose tolerance test, they are giving 75 gram of glucose and they are not measuring the serum glucose, but they are measuring the growth hormone level. Normally the growth hormone level dropping below the normal range. However, if the patient has, for example, adenoma, that can be increase, cause an increase of the growth hormone secretion or the suppression won't be enough or there is no suppression at all. Now IGF-1, usually this is what they choose. That's the first one because they are relatively, they are not changed by the diurnary. So the level is pretty constant. So this one measurement, it should be good to evaluate the growth hormone production. Of course, MRI scan applied immediately and 70%, 75% of the adenoma is mostly macroadenoma. So the patient could have some visual disturbance there by temporary hemorrhage or headache or other additional sign. But to rule out, for example, the ectopic chest and abdominal imaging should be performed and esophageal, for example, scans could be performed as well. 
Now, acromegaly, these are the typical sign, the clinical features. Usually, the patient will have a grow of the hands and the feet, the tissue enlargement, and then acral enlargement. This is why it's called acromegaly, because the acral area, they still can grow. And uh, internal organ enlargement, very, very characteristic one, the liver, red, heart is going to enlarge. So the heart can be about almost 10 times bigger than a normal situation. And the better chest and kyphosis can happen in this patient. Patient could have sleep apnea due to the enlargement of the soft tissues, for example. Inappropriate carbohydrate metabolism. This patient usually has insulin resistance, so the glucose homeostasis alters, so diabetes, secondary diabetes can develop. Hypertension or ischemic heart disease can develop in this patient. Hypertension can be due to the increased insulin level that causes the increase of the sodium potassium ATPs, more sodium retention, hypervolemia, plus the growth hormone can cause a thickening of the media of the vessels, so the peripheral resistance is going to increase. Plus the insulin directly has a sympathetic stimulation of the central nervous system, so this again causes a hypertension. Mass effect of the, uh, the uh, for example, that can cause additional hormone that released from the pituitary that decreased. So that can cause hypogonadism, that can manifest it as a menstrual disorders, or hypothyroidism, that can develop, let's see, uh, hypothyroidism. And for example, tiredness, weakness. And for sure, the thyroid function test can be normal when you evaluate the thyroid gland, the peripheral thyroid gland. And the, the patient who has an elevated growth hormone has a higher tendency to develop neoplastic disorders. For example, colon polyps or GI or breast or prostate or thyroid cancers. Now, how we treat acromegaly? Basically, surgery, removing transphenoidal uh, dectomy and medication, you can use some uh, receptor blockers or somatostatin allergics, uh, bromocryptin, depending if the patient has, for example, prolactin enlargement as well, and radiotherapy if you cannot reach these uh, organs. Now, let's look at, for example, some case studies. Through the case studies, we can evaluate or we can understand much easier these problems. We do have a 20-year-old man, and according to him, his height and weight increased gradually in childhood. Uh, the ultrasound proved uh, steatosis hepatis have been known for seven years. His liver enzymes are elevated. One year ago, polyuria, polydipsia developed, so diabetes mellitus, and two months ago, he was hospitalized due to hyperglycemia. His father and grandfather also very high with similar physique. He is tall and moderately obese. This was the status. His height was two meters and weighed 122 kilograms, and the foot size is 47, let's see, so the size of 12. Several Necros, light red tree can be seen in the inguinal and armpit areas. The edge of the liver is reachable, so the splenomegaly can be achieved. Now, let when we do have the evaluation, the hormone only we list, let's see, the hormones that is altered. As you see here, the IGF-1 level is high and the prolactin level is high. Meanwhile, the testosterone level is low. When we looked at the Stella with MRI, they found a microadenoma because the size of this adenoma is between two and three millimeters. And ophthalmologists, they no field, visual field disturbances, no retinopathy because it's too small to compress the chiasma. And the diagnosis is acromegaly, so the therapy, the transphenoidal synectomy, so they removed the gland, the, I mean the tumor for the gland hyperprolactinemia. Now that's a, this is the most common clinical symptoms, the most common uh, tumor relatively that rise from the pituitary. Uh, about 40% of the old pituitary tumor is a prolactin secreting tumor. Now, uh, what can be, let's see the treatment and what can be the clinical symptoms? 
usually the dopamine can control it, so can cause the decrease of the hormone release. And not only the hormone release can be altered, but the growth of the adenoma can be altered and can be regulated. Now, physiologically, what is going to increase the productive level? Mostly pregnancy or breastfeeding or sleep and stress, all is going to increase the productive level and can cause an increased prolactin and the consequence of the prolactin. Drug, for example, dopamine antagonist or high dose of estrogen can cause an elevation. That's very important because in some cases, if somebody is taking anti-concipients, they can have an elevated prolactin level. So that should be uh, kept in, the, let's say, inside that the oral contraceptives can alter the prolactin level. Some abnormal situations such as, for example, the breast, uh, for example, injury or hair pencil study infection. So anything that can stimulate the breast or cause pain, that can include increase the prolactin level. Now, uh, clinical features. Usually if you do have an elevated prolactin level, the reproductive function decreases because the GNR rate is altered by prolactin. So the GNR rate release is suppressed by the prolactin. And this is why the LH, FSH level is lower one. And the consequence, the estrogen testosterone synthesis decreases. But additionally, loss of libido, osteoporosis and fractures. And the macroadenoma, they do have a mass effect, the bitemperate hemianopsia can be shown in separated uh, gender. In women, very commonly amenorrhea and oligoamenorrhea can happen, anovulation, galactoria, and breast atrophy can happen because only the, uh, not the, uh, let's see, the adipocytes uh, or adipose tissue bond is going to uh, increase, it decreases in the breast, so uh, that can cause. And Intracourse may be painful in patients due to the dryness of the vagina. In men can happen impotence or decrease of the spermatogenesis. And gynecomastia can happen. Further, galactoria can happen in men as well. And loss of the secondary sexual hair can happen in men. Now, how can we detect the hyperprolactinemia? Well, basically determining the prolactin level. Now can use, for example, a dopamine antagonist test, the methoclopamide test, that and uh, that usually causes a prolactin stimulation. And if you do have a hypertrophy or adenoma, adenoma will increase tremendously the prolactin release. MRI or visual field test could be performed. The therapy, mostly drug, what we use, dopamine dopamine agonists such as bromocryptin. That can be used in macroadenoma and microadenoma as well. It's much better than to perform some uh, removal of the drug. Very rarely they perform surgery, mostly if they do have a visual disturbance or some kind of compression sign. And irradiation can be used in this situation. Now, let's see the case two studies. We do have a 29-year-old man with gynecomastia and impotence, and we do find an increased prolactin level, and the MRI showed that the microadenoma in the adenohypophysis. Okay, so the diagnosis hyperprolactinemia and the treatment was bromocyptin, and this is how the patient should be kept. And in macro, as I mentioned, the bromocyptin causes a regression of the size of the tumor. The Cushing syndrome. Uh, we are going to talk about when we discuss the adrenal gland, but generally the Cushing syndrome that we do have in our case now, we do have a central Cushing syndrome that is called the Cushing diseases. When we do have the pituitary adenoma, that's a Cushing disease. Cushing syndrome, that's a general clinical sign of a chronic glucocorticoid excess. So Cushing syndrome alone, this statement doesn't show you what the problem is. It can be peripheral, 
when we do have an adenoma of the gland, so the target gland is involved, can be central one, now that's a Cushing disease, or can be ectopic one, when we do have a CR, uh, for example, the ACT is secreting, uh, secreting small cell carcinoma of the lung, but it can be CRH overproduction as well. Now, uh, this kind of uh, diseases, usually at the differentiation, we are going to discuss under the adrenal practice, so I'm not going to talk too much about it. But the general symptoms of the Cushing syndrome include the moon face and usually the red cheeks and the fat pads, that's a buffalo harm, very easy bruising, for example, thinning of the skin, red stries can be detected, and uh, uh, poor wound healing. Usually the slim extravities, it's very characteristic, is due to the proteolysis that induced by the release of the glucocorticoids because glucocorticoids causes proteolysis and increased uh, 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 gluconeogenesis. Now the high blood pressure is very characteristic, uh, for example, and you see this uh, central obesity of the patient. Now, diabetes insipidus, uh, that's an other uh, things that could develop in the pituitary or the hypothalamic problem. Basically, diabetes insipidus means we do have a lot of urine, increased urine production, but it's not due to osmotic diuresis such as happening in diabetes, but this is due to the absence of the ADH. So this way the patient will have polyuria and polydipsia. So it feels the thirsty all the time, drinks a lot and piss a lot. This is what will be the clinical symptoms. Now, this diabetes insipidus has two types. One, the central type, when we do have ADH deficiency and we do have a peripheral or nephrogenic type, when the distal convoluted tubule uh, doesn't re uh, respond to the ADH. Now, we have to differentiate this diabetes insipidus for the cyhogenic polydipsia. Cyhogenic polydipsia is manifested when the patient uh, somehow has a force to drink all the time. Drinking, and of course, if you have an increased load of water, the hypotonic solution, you, the kidney will respond, okay, to excrete the excess of the water. So the patient drinks, and pieces. Uh, this happening very similarly if you drink a lot of beer, because what you do have, you do have a load of the water, let's say the beer, and this excess water should be, let's see, excreted by the kidney. Plus the alcohol inhibits the ADH secretion in the uh, hypothalamus, and this is why you are pissing more if you drink alcohol or coffee. That's another thing that can cause a uh, uh, polyuria. Now, so these things should be distinguished, the diabetes insipidus and thyogenic polydipsia. Now, let's see first the central diabetes insipidus when we do have a problem with the production of the ADH, mostly destruction of the ADH producing supraorbital or periventricular nuclei or interruption of the transport to the axons. Uh, However, about 50% of the cases is idiopathic. It can be immune-mediated process of the destruction of these cells, but trauma, tumor, for example, uh, can cause uh, central diabetes insipidus. What be the clinical symptoms? Basically, we do have polyuria. When we do have a urine output is more than three liters per day, uh, mostly, but of course, it's depending on the fluid intake. So in the summertime, when you sweat a lot, you drink a lot, but you're not uh, pissing too much. If you go and drink beer, of course, you do have, you could have more than three liters per day, but this is not, let's see, a typical sign for diabetes insipidus. Now, uh, however, with the normal osmarity, if you do have the normal osmarity and you do drink less, or do piss less than two liters, that can exclude the diabetes insipidus. Now, sometimes uh, the diabetes insipidus, it can be unmaxed by cortisol replacement. Right? What does it mean? 
if the patient has, for example, some kind of pituitary hypofunction, and mostly the cortisol level is decreased, and when they start treating the patient with cortisol, now this is how the diabetes insipidus is manifesting because the GFR, the GFR, the volume of the GFR is altered by the cortisol, affecting by the cortisol. And if somebody has a decreased cortisol level, decreased cortisol level will decrease the filtrated fluid, and that's meaning that there's not enough, let's see, fluid excreted, so that enough urine. However, when you start giving the cortisol to the patient, well, they can normalize the GFR, they can normalize the filtration volume, and this is how the uh, central diabetes insipidus is manifested. And other thing, for example, during pregnancy can be manifested because the placenta has a vasopressinase enzyme and vasopressinase can decrease the ADH level. And if you had less ADH, that was okay to maintain the normal urine volume. But now because you are pregnant, the vasopressinase releases or decreases the ADH secretion and can uh, cause diabetes insipidus. So this is how it's manifested. How can the clinical sign occur immediately? Now, nephrogenous diabetes insipidus, mostly that's include, of course, the kidney. Sometimes, for example, lithium therapy or amphotericin or gentamicin or loop diuretics can cause this one. Electrolyte disorders, hypercalcemia or hypokalemia that can cause nephrogenous diabetes, or renal diseases, including obstructive uropathies, or chronic renal failure, or, uh, or prost transplant uh, uh, kidney failure, or pyelonephritis. This all can cause renal. Uh, diabetes insipidus, but sarcoidosis, amyloid, or multiple myeloma, sickle cell diseases, and sometimes pregnancy can cause uh, nephrogenic diabetes uh, insipidus. Now, congenitally are relatively very like and usually presented in the first week. There are some other genetic abnormalities, which, for example, when we do have the absence of vasopressin 2, vasopressin 2 receptor defect or the aquaporin channel defect, they are very rare. Very uh, interesting one, what the treatment of the nephrogenous diabetes insipidus. The central one very easily, you can give ADH to the patient. Mostly what they do, they give some uh, no spray, the vasopressin. However, in nephrogenic diabetes, when the vasopressin doesn't work in the tubular system, what can you use? They use diuretics. When they use diuretics, relatively what they have causes hypovolemia, and increases the aldosterone synthesis. Aldosterone causes a sodium and water retention, and the patient will have less urine output. So that can be the treatment, or of course, if you cure the cause, that's uh, the other treatment as well. Now, what will be the uh, laboratory sign or clinical sign of diabetes insipidus? If you look at the specific gravity of urine is less than 1003. Normally, the urine gravity is ranging from 1004 to 1036. That's a very, very wide range. So the kidney can dilute about 10 times. So it's meaning that we do have a serum osmolality of 300 milliosmol. So the urine osmolality, it can be as low as 30 milliosmol. When the kidney concentrate, it can go up to 1200. So 1200 milliosmol, so four times higher than a serum osmolality. Now the serum uh, sodium concentration basically is not changing, or it can be increased a little bit uh, up to 150. It's not increases or because the patient, if they can access the water, relatively, they can maintain the serum osmolarity because they feel thirsty, they will drink. So this way it's maintaining the serum osmolarity and the osmolarity mainly determined by the serum sodium concentration. However, if the patient cannot access water, now that the, serum, the plasma osmolality and the serum sodium concentration will increase. Immediately, we have to perform the MRI. Now, how can we test 
Well, the simplest way to use the water deprivation test is meaning that for eight hours, the patient should not access, let's see, water. And we are measuring the urine osmolarity and measuring the serum sodium concentration. If the serum concentration, serum sodium increases over 150, immediately you can stop the reaction and fine. And uh, however, if somebody has, for example, polydipsia or a normal situation, what will happen? The body is sensing that the serum osmolality starts to increase, so more ADH. ADH is going to cause the reabsorption of the water, so the urine osmolality will increase. However, the serum osmolality or serum sodium concentration does not change. However, in diabetes insipidus, as I mentioned, that urine osmolality doesn't change, so it's still around 1,003, close to water. And the plasma osmolality in the serum sodium starts to increase. Another test, that's a desmopressing test. And usually they are using an analog of the ADH, the nasal spray. And if you do have a central diabetes insipidus, for sure the urine osmolality starts to increase. And, and the serum sodium level should be normal. However, when we do have a nephrogenic diabetes insipidus, there's no response at all. Now, uh, so this water deprivation test is good to separate basically the psychogenic polydipsia and the diabetes and the true diabetes insipidus. However, in some condition, in some condition, the patient will cheat because you cannot let's see, watch the patient for eight hours. And those patients who has the psychogenic polydipsia, usually they are drinking. And this way, maybe the results be false. What they do, they have another test that's called the sodium loading test. When they give a sodium salt solution to the patient, IV, and measuring the urine osmolarity. Normally, if you do have a psychogenic polydipsia, the urine osmolarity will increase and the volume decreases. So that's a, a other test that they can perform to separate, let's see, the diabetes insipidus from the psychogenic polydipsia. And that test called the Robertson test. Okay, another thing that can happen when we have too much ADH. And this is what is called the syndromes of inappropriate ADH secretion. So relatively, we have more ADH that is needed. So we do have an increase of overproduction of the ADH. And that syndrome is called the Schwartz-Barter syndrome. What can be the cause? It can be neoplasia, for example, cells, uh, small cell lung cancer. This can cause any kind of paraneoplastic syndrome. Infection on you know, the lung or, or the uh, central nervous system, meningitis or abscess of the brain. Neurological, for example, subarachnoid hemorrhage can cause this. Iatrogenic central drugs or chemotherapy drug can cause this. And hypothyroidism and the sarcoidosis can cause this. Sarcoid tumor can cause this as CIATS or syndromes of inappropriate ADS secretion. And what is the problem with the CIATS? Basically, we always has a concentrated urine. So we do have hyponatremia and fluid uh, retention and cerebral edema or water intoxication can develop. So cerebral edema is the biggest problem. The weakness, confusion, nausea, irritability, muscle twitching, or pathological reflexes, scissors, and coma can develop in this patient. Uh, sometimes the patient can have hypertension, but sometimes has normal, normal blood pressure. Serum potassium is normal. But kidney adrenal functions are normal in this situation. How would the diagnosis see us? Usually we can measure the urine and the serum osmolarity at the two together. If the serum osmolarity is less than a urine osmolality that indicates that inappropriate excretion of concentrated urine in the presence of very diluted serum, because the serum level mostly is less than 134 and the serum osmolality is less. Why the urine gravity is always higher one. So this can 
measured means that you produce a undiluted urine together with a hypoosmolarity in the serum. So that's be the hallmark of the uh, syndromes of inappropriate ADA secretion. Okay, so that was about uh, 